an architect because I was concerned that the architect must be a special architect because we didn't want to be talking about ramps and other matters. And I noticed the illustration takes us right off the phone. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, I'm, I'm extremely honored and delighted to have been asked to give the last talk in this rather remarkable series at the end of a rather remarkable year and at the start of something even more remarkable, which is the establishment of this course at the AA, at the School of Architecture. Now, if I um, appear a little boring, I, I want the forbearance of those who aren't architects in the audience. Um, if I appear to repeat myself, or to explain the obvious too long, just remember that to grow architecture also produces a lot of dead wood. Um, now, first lesson, history. Before the Almighty created architects, uh, there were people um, designing and building rather particular, rather special enclosures, buildings. And they ranged from cathedrals, temples, universities, and lunatic asylums. Uh, they all had uh, one thing in common, and it was a particular architectural element, or at least it required architectural attention, and that was the place of access. Most of them had a place of egress as well. We'll get on to that later. But this place of access was um, special in so much as it was the container, uh, i.e. the building, to quote Rainer Bannum quoting me, we're in the container business or we're in no business at all. Um, it is the container that um, has the entrance, and it is an entrance to the objects contained therein. And people uh, came there as, uh, as a sort of a second-rate element in the equation. So access was available to people, but the container was to protect that which it contained. Now, it wasn't so much containing priests and monks and dreary old professors as jewels, chalices, the Almighty himself in some form or other, and in the case of universities, books, chained books, usually written in a language not native to the country where the enclosure was built, Latin. Chain books, knowledge, information, closely guarded, closely controlled, in this place which had a particular, um, it had access, but the access was in a way made difficult. It was made grand or it was defended. It had a drawbridge or it had heavy gates. And you felt terribly grateful that you had been enabled to have access to those, those things within, those which were contained. And then, history lesson two, moving on a bit, those who were entitled to contain this, these goods, this information, these jewels, the secret, the something which one went to visit. Uh, they themselves were treated, or at least they treated themselves, a little better than the visitors, than the, 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 ex, the people with access. And this, for instance, a good example of this, is the bell in the 19th century uh, milliner's or chemist's shop 
which tells the person running the shop that a customer has come in and they put down their cup of tea and serve the customer and it also tells them just when they're leaving. It is of no particular benefit to the person making access. It is purely for the benefit of the person already there. Now, um, goods and services change with time. And they change in such uh, a degree, we'll take, we'll take less than three today, uh, that some of the goods, i.e. those chained Bibles, those library books, are available elsewhere on the newsstands, or even more important, on the radio and television. So, in fact, some of the, the peculiarity of these places, which have very controlled, limited, and important access to them, have, have spread, a widespread, have become, in a way, broadcast, uh, literally, and invisible in physical terms. But the information is still there. So, you can say books not have been replaced by TV, but are certainly rivaled by TV. And you can say that money, money in your pocket, is rivaled by uh, telephone and computer credit banks, which you can operate entirely by the phone. Now, of course, banks were a great place for access and entrance and, and event and occasion. Now, the um, product change actually also produces a process change. Uh, I'll explain this. The, uh, one of the largest single types of architecture built over the last 10 years of greed in this country was the office building. Now, it is probably one of the... Uh, most likely buildings to become redundant in its form completely far faster than, than museums, universities, or indeed cathedrals will. And therefore you get, for instance, the uh, president-elect of the RIBA writing an admirable book on modern office design, which is really more like a first aid book than a book on architecture. It really, it doesn't talk about uh, the usefulness of offices to meet people who you trust, can see, or be privy to information there. It talks about illumination, air conditioning, and seats which make you reasonably comfortable to operate things uh, on the desk top. Um, well, th this is not uh, likely to, to be a great generator of, of either architectural form or much interest in relation to the profession, but even more so in relation to the community at large. And um, I, I reckon that uh, the... Well, no, it doesn't matter. We'll just leave it back. Chapter 2. People. Now, we're all bugged and have a constant fight with the world of inanimate objects. All of us. Most of us, at least once every 24 hours. Some who are lucky, uh, two or three or four times in a lifetime. But they're very lucky. Now, we're bugged by inanimate objects when they appear to be the inappropriate size. And this usually occurs in the first five years of our life. But it may be ten years, depending on whether we take our milk or not. And then there's another period of our life, towards the end, when they not only appear, they appear the correct size, but, but rather difficult to move, or at least they seem to move themselves into difficult places. Um, in between times, the world of inanimate objects who are waging a war on us uh, are joined by other uh, circumstances, such as 
being in a country whose language one can neither understand nor speak. Um, being in a cinema when there is alert, an alert. Uh, being late for an aeroplane while in the passenger terminal where all the signs are hung and the letters are designed in such a way that we could read them uh, beautifully having put down a copy of graphics first at our ease but if we're, f we're five minutes late for the plane they uh, enter this this horde this army of inanimate objects which are out to do a scene um, there's also other things that, that sort of assistant helpers in this conspiracy. Um, various life conditions. I think they're best described as tired and emotional. When one is tired and emotional, like, uh, then these objects combine with them to make things pretty unpleasant. And it is something which up till now, the architects have tended to do nothing more than um, a curative act, a band-aid act. I'll make the letters a bit bigger. I'll round the corners. I'll make that surface non-slim. I'll make it a little cooler in here. I wish we could. An example of this, for instance, is the the street where I live is one-way street and therefore when I intend to cross the road I look one way in direction of oncoming traffic. The other morning I was damn near killed because the local dust rubbish collection service has been privatized and they have a new truck and it reverses up the road rather than goes the right way. So I'm unlikely to see it while I'm looking for traffic coming. Added to the fact that it plays for some unknown reason jingle bells. So I didn't even imagine there was a truck involved. I thought what idiots left his car radio on playing jingle bells at this time of the year and then there was almost this trouble with the inanimate object. Um, that's just an example, but it is also an example that one has to constantly be relearning the language in order to, to uh, <coughs> combat these awful things, these objects. It's a stupid language, but now I know Jingle bells is dangerous, and I look the opposite direction to the direction in which traffic is coming. But how long that will last, I don't know. So it's constantly needing to be renewed. And this actually causes, in people like me, at instances, not necessarily crossing the road, um, fear through ignorance. But I'm also feared of the inherent ignorance that something might happen that I haven't thought about it, the possibility of it happening. So one has a constant um, a sort of uh, intelligence coward's a, approach to life where, where in fact one tunes up the sharp sensitive uh, nerve ends for this fear of, of not knowing what the language is that will ensure me not being hit by the proverbial rubbish truck. Now, once again, this is a world of inanimate objects, not, not the other villains, in handle those. And it has not been, uh, It has not sufficiently been addressed by the architectural profession. Now, why is this? Perhaps uh, they're too busy doing other things, designing museums, 
not worrying about danger, fear, ignorance, or intelligence. Designing for fun. Um, and uh, this, this, uh, avoidance of the most direct influences on our lives. And some are nice. Fear, at times, if relieved, can be awfully smug and satisfying, if relieved. They don't seem to concern themselves with that. Let me give you an example and take now the point that I raised earlier on, and that is the opposite, I think it is the opposite, of access, which is egress, leaving the place. Now, without giving a very long architectural lecture, I think I only have to quote that appalling building by Bob Venturi, the extension to the uh, National Museum, or whatever, National Gallery. And you'll see what I mean about egress not necessarily being quite as nice as access. You walk up the stairs one way, you go and try it, and you walk down the same stairs quite another way. It isn't the same experience at all. In fact, it is an extremely disturbing experience walking down. However, that is only through people making free choice, wanting to see looted art painted in other continents. Um, <laughs> therefore, up to, a, up to a certain point, they get what they pay for. But, <coughs> let's think of something else. Fire. Fire escape. Well, as we can't show Towering Inferno, which I recommend as a sort of appendix to this series, and perhaps we'll get it one day at the end, show it the full way. It's a very interesting film. Um, it's interesting in that it is very long, and it plays with people that you ally yourself to, famous faces, and even they get burnt. You know, Fred Astaire. Um, uh, I can't remember who they were, but you, you think, oh, no, I mean, it's far too expensive. He won't get burnt. He gets burnt. Um, so, so the fear comes, you know, who, God knows, who's going to burn next, you know, a film like this. And the other thing is that you do see, and there's some good acting in it, you, you actually see um, panic and fear and change of nature in the same faces of people who have been in that building day in, day out, but have not had that situation of urgency put on them long before there are flames or anything like that. So that, that is a quite good film, but we're not showing that tonight. However, what it does raise for those few remaining architects who are in the room, um, that, that I would have thought that there might be quite a good uh, a subject, program, in seeing how many buildings you can design on one floor rather than a lot of floors. Now, you can, you can do it economic things. You can uh, do land assessments and things. You get the plan, planning research unit at Bartlett to help you if it still exists. But I don't think that. Just think about the advantages of being on one floor. Because wealthy Arabs and, and 18th century aristocrats in several European countries thought about it and decided it was a good thing. So wealthy Arabs live in tents or in this country in bungalows with porticos and they go to sleep against their camel saddles. The Emir of Abu Dhabi does just that down in, in uh, Sussex when it gets too hot in his own country. In the uh, finer houses, the, the floor on which the family lived was usually one floor. Bedrooms, salons, dining rooms, galleries, music rooms, all together. And the servicing part of the life went on below them, 
downstairs, as did the rats and the water, and they were called kitchens. And then when they weren't there were people involved, when they weren't uh, involved with the kitchen, they slept upstairs, thus providing uh, another layer of security and safety to the single-floored aristocrats. I just mention that in passing, that it's worth thinking about the single floor, because it's worth thinking just how dreadful a fire escape is when there's a fire. It baffles me that, that we have uh, automatic chutes which you can slide down, you can even sing and, and suck a lollipop at the same time, out of three four-story high jumbo jets every time of day. But a building half that height, you have, you have the, the, the one escape is the fire escape, a rusty, dangerous, see-through metal contraction. So think about whether um, it needs to, whether it needs to be like that. Whether, whether we just assume office spot, it's got to be that big, more floors. So, so. Uh, I don't know what you did with that, I'm sorry. Um, the, the point about the, uh, this program and these talks is that every time, and I missed some, some of the talks, but the general thing, and the, talking to the participants of the course, there is immediate understanding about what was meant by that old 19th century definition of architecture as being firmness, commodity, and delight. It doesn't have a single architectural element in it. It doesn't talk about the fold or the kink or the nuance of, of angular floors, anything like that. Firmness, commodity, and delight. Now, we can do a bit better than the 19th century definition, I should have thought. And in fact, this, this um, course has added clarity, comprehension and delight to those architectural basic premises which you accept or you don't. But if you don't, be prepared to question why you reject them. Now, um, the... Uh, The new, the, the, the new relationship of access, or at least the new container and its new form of access, is usually described in relation to the objects and systems that are not architectural. For instance, the odd man, odd old-fashioned man out of the series in air travel is, is the terminal building. There's an aeroplane, there's a car, or there's a bus. And there's a terminal building in the middle. That's the odd man out. That is where things go wrong. That is where, instead of traveling in the air, you are delayed in a, in a, in a liquor store for an hour longer than you need to by some trumped-up bomb scare. The aeroplane, fine. The bus, <coughs> the train, the car, fine. The architecture, to call it constipated, is polite. <laughs> it is worrying that where in fact, when in fact there's talk of uh, new rail travel in this country, new terminals, they use the phrase that the terminals will be up to the standard of, of airline lounges. <laughs> I mean, that's one reason that one goes on a train, is that you can, right, as dust carts allowing, you can cross the street from the pub straight into the train and on the way. So the access uh, 
cannot just be left to chance. And it can't be left to chance for all of us. There is no exception. We're going to be caught by those inanimate objects unless the architects do something about it. Now, I say the architects. There are lots of people who do things about congregation of persons, of uh, friendly meeting places, of, of, of meaningful random social intercourse. Uh, all that, they do it under trees, around the back sides of sculpture, in old squares. It doesn't always need architects. But on the other hand, architects could provide, going back to our six titles, a little bit more delight, a little bit more safety for all of us. Now, then, then the whole uh, point that I made earlier about no band-aid becomes a little bit more obvious. Band-aid in architecture means, or I mean, a slovenliness, a slovenliness of design approach that too quickly replaces real design with three-dimensional ingenuity and then describes it as whatever. Now, it, it's far easier to be lazy, to get out the old first aid tin of standard tricks, to draw thresholds, revolving doors, always fully glazed, staircases to galleries, my word, don't they make us feel grand, and, and the rest of it. It's easy, but it's cheap, and as far as I'm concerned, it isn't architecture. Ah, then we say, what is? What is? What should we be working at? You sneer at that, and you sneer at that. Well, I tell you what we should be working at, for one. We should be working at the art and science of, of enabling activities and happenings, be they random or planned, that hitherto could not occur in the built environment. They could occur over the telephone, in a love letter, in a, in a book. Why can't they care? Why is architecture so insensitive? Compared with, with um, hush puppies or the simplest of drugs, the aspirin, it's light years away in, in a sensitive tuning, a capacity to be properly packaged and to last as long as it's needed and provide delight or relief. Now, that's what enabling is about and that's what architecture could do and I have seen in this course the nearest thing to a, a comprehensive approach to so many uh, opportunities of new design they're not it's not a band-aid situation it isn't uh, glum and um, we're up against it, folks, so we'll try and do that. Not at all. If you look at this course, and if you go to the lectures next year, or if there are any more this year, you will find that all the time there is an enabling element in life patterning which requires, doesn't want necessarily... I, I, I don't know the difference between needs or require, so I'll rephrase that. Which calls out for architecture, though it isn't absolutely essential. But it is to the architect, because in fact, he is proving himself less and less useful to the community. That's why, rather like old elephants who honk at each other as on their way to the valley where they die, but no white man has seen. 
the only time they ever, ever speak to each other, elephants, rather than fight, is when they're on the way out, when they've had it. They realize there were mammoths after all. And that is what is happening to the architectural profession. <laughs> they honk with their heads deep in color photography. <coughs> no, we're better than that. And this course gives not a clue, but a touchstone. We don't have to search for it, it's bloody clear. And all it is, is that it has actually in this building, it has held up a mirror to ourselves. And on first looking in the mirror, we recognize ourselves, but hey, up, there's something wrong. We're sort of back to front. Sort of. We have to go through that mirror. We have to go through the mirror in order to find one of the key, not the only one, but one of the key roles of architect of the future. And I can do no better, because I've decided to end here, than to read Lewis Carroll through a looking glass. Alice, obviously an architect, boring girl. <laughs> well, in our country, said Alice, still a little panting, you'd probably get to somewhere else if you ran very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. Typical architect. Wanting sympathy and half exhausted. <laughs> a slave sort of country, said the Queen. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. That's what this course suggests we do. And that's why I'm very honored to give the last talk. Thank you.